Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Madeline, and I am an alcoholic. (laughs) My sobriety date is November the 14th of 1985. I'd like to tell you it was a really rough day in kindergarten. Um, My home group is the How It Works group in Happy Valley, Oregon, and we meet on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. And I'll tell you that it's a happening place because we have AA, Al-Anon, Alateen, and free child care going on all at the same time. Um, So there are a lot of folks who come there because of all the opportunity it provides underneath one roof on that Tuesday night. Um, and they're deeply involved and entrenched in service, and that's why I love them, because I'm a geek. Um, I want to thank the committee um, for asking me here. I want to thank the speakers, um, although i got to tell you, I always hate following the Al-Anon. Um, it's kind of like, and here's the beautiful Al-Anon, and next we have the bar skank. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, Julie. <clears throat> Um, but, you know, and, and I, I have to say that, you know, speaking is not something I came into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous and said, oh, boy, I can't wait to do that. I grew up a neurotically shy child that, like, shook violently in a crowd and had to sit in a special chair outside of the cafeteria because otherwise I cried, I would hyperventilate, I would throw up, and I would pass out. Look like the kid on South Park. And, um... <clears throat> They kill Kenny. Anyway, um, I, I did not like podiums when I was a child, and I damn sure didn't come into Alcoholics Anonymous and look up there and go, I want to do that someday. Um, I, I wanted to avoid it at all costs. Um, I figured I had nothing so important that I need to come up there. And I got it too. I think speaking is a heady game. Um, when people begin to treat you like you're some special class of alcoholic when you share your story, And I can tell you that even before I speak, I always go through this whole mind game of what the hell have I gotten myself into? You know, you shouldn't be there. Everybody else is better than you. And, and, uh, and in the end I, I get down to why am I here? I'm here because I want to save my own ass. And I want to make sure that anyone who's new or not new in these rooms knows that there's hope and then this program works. And I really have to get rid of any idea of being popular or if anyone else likes me. And I can tell you, I spoke at a convention in Massachusetts, and I actually had an old guy cut the line, uh, receiving line, to tell me how bad I sucked. And uh, (laughs) um, and after he did so and ran, the people said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Um, It appears he was uh, hated the fact that I was a woman and that I was from the South, and he was furious because I said ass crap and whore in my to- in my story. <laughs> and I thought, I don't remember mentioning your wife once, asshole. But, uh, <laughs> I thought, you don't get out much, do you? And, uh, <laughs> but I can tell you that I laid in bed that night and I thought about the 500 people who told me that they were, you know, were gracious and said thank you, but I laughed. I sat there and I laughed about it because I was obsessed with the one guy who said I sucked. And I said, you know, God's keeping it real for you, Madeline. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I can tell you that this was... Um, I'm a really good worker being Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and, I, and so this was never something I wanted to do. Um, most people know um, I will avoid the podium if I can at all costs. Um, I believe podium should come with stirrups because I feel the same way when I go to the gynecologist. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you understand what I'm talking about, that it's an unnatural position, and you feel very exposed, and you don't feel like sharing, and you just want out of there as soon as possible. And And I always need to pee and have gas, and the same thing happens here. And unlike Todd, who crapped his pants, I will fake my own death before I let that happen. So... But I remember I had been asked to share my story, um, and I was one of those people who got to AA and thought, boy, isn't it great I got here before I got in any trouble. And then I slowed down. You know how they talk about going through life, 
throwing crap in the back of the station wagon, and you get sober, and you slam on the brakes, and all that shit hits the front seat. Well, that was my sobriety. I got sober, and all my pigeons came home to roost. And so all my wreckage found me when I got sober. And so I was not someone who was happy, joyous, and free in early sobriety. I was dodging boogeymen right and left. And, and I remember I'd been asked to share my story, and it was a particularly tough time for me. <clears throat> Boo-hoo. And uh, I went to my sponsor and I said, you know, they asked me to come and tell my story at this group, but I don't think I should go. I mean, look at my life. What am I going to tell them? Stay sober and your life can suck too? And, um, <clears throat> and she did what she usually did, which she set me up in a drunk trap. She said, well, you know, I hear you. Um, if you can find it in the big book where it says you, you know, really shouldn't go, um, you can you can say no. And I mean, I went pouring through this book because it made perfect sense to me that there had to be a paragraph that said, if you're that sick, please stay home and don't spread the disease. And um, I can tell you what I found is my favorite paragraph in the big book. And it's page 102. And it says, your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth, podiums, on such an errand. <laughs> keep on the firing line of life with these motives, and God will keep you unharmed. So that's why I do what I do. That's why Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me to not say no, unless I've got a really good reason. Because I came crawling into these rooms. My life didn't work with alcohol, and it didn't work without it. I couldn't live and I couldn't die, and the last chance I had on this planet was you folks. So I never, ever want to walk away from anything if I think I can be helpful, any way, any time. Um, any of y'all caught on to a little uh, twang? Um, it ain't Oregon. Um, I am born and raised in uh, Houston, Texas, <clears throat> into a bleeding deacon family of Southern Baptists, and... Um, <clears throat> My parents are both dead, but their names were Joseph and Mary. No shit. And, uh, <laughs> and, they did, and there was no alcohol. They didn't drink. Um, what I know now is that I came from parents who'd come from alcoholic families that they never talked about, and they were going to be different. And I can tell you that just because you don't drink does not make you better. Um, they say if you take an alcoholic and you take away alcohol, um, all you've got left is ick. And we were very icky. Um, and uh, we, we were polished at looking good on the outside, but we were all kinds of screwed up on the inside. My father was a type who might drink a beer and mow in the lawn, not finish it. My mother at one point was having trouble sleeping, so someone advised her if she drank a little wine at night that it would help her sleep. So we drove to the next town over to buy it, because heaven forbid someone from the church saw her with that in her cart. And, um, and I remember her drinking like one finger of wine and saying, I've got to stop, I'm starting to feel it. And as a small child, this drove me mad. I thought, of course you're supposed to feel it. Drink the rest of that wine. I was obsessed with alcohol from the time I was little, even though I didn't really grow up around anyone drinking in my life. All I knew was that it looked like Everything else I saw, that people were having fun, and I didn't grow up in a fun family. Um, I felt very cheated when I came to A, and I heard you telling your stories about your great drunk families and the brawls and the fights and the parties. Oh, dear Jesus, my family was like, you could flash over them, it was like crickets. <laughs> I mean, they were so dull and so boring. Um, you know, uh, straight A's on a report card, woo! Um, and... Uh, we were just so uptight, though, because we had no solution. We had all that ism and no solution going on at home. And, um, and I can tell you, my father was in the music industry, um, which is very odd for a Southern Baptist, um, but it was kind of that anomaly. And, you know, they say Baptists are like cats. You know, they're doing it. You just can't catch them. And, um, <laughs> and being in the music industry, he got given these massive decanters of booze, all these limited edition bottles and everything. And my mother, the freak, would go, that is so pretty. And she would put it in these bookcase shelves in our house that went across this one wall. I mean, all these bottles. And I can tell you um, that when I hit about 13 years old, I had had all the fun you can milk out of straight A's and a report card. Now, I have a twin brother. He is my polar opposite. And for those of you, I wish I could tell you how many times I have had someone ask me if my twin brother and I are identical. <laughs> no! No! <laughs> 
Did you skip biology that day? Uh, <clears throat> but he is like Mr. Normal, Mr. Do the Right Thing. And, uh, but by God, he was easily corrupted. And, um, and when I was 13, I talked him into cracking open one of those bottles because I wanted to try what was in those, those cases. And, um, it was like the classic twin study for me because you can tell he took that drink, it burned and went down and plopped for him. And I took my first drink, big slug, go big or go home. And I feel like I exhale for the first time in my life. That neurotically shy, scared child who always looked like she was about to fly apart at the seams exhaled. And I thought, I like this. I can do this all day long. And, uh, and I can tell you, he had no interest in finishing that bottle, and I did. And I can tell you, when I got sober 13 years later, I had to tell my mother that there had been water in those bottles <laughs> since, like, 1974. Um, nobody was ever, those are the freaks I grew up with, nobody was ever going to even try what was in those cases. I, however, finished it before the age of 15. Um, now, I'll tell you that I always, I drank the same way the first time to the last time. I always drank like a pig. I always had an amount problem. I always had this wanting to just get out there feeling. I know how to drink under duress. I know how to have to control it in situation, situations. But my my dream was always drink to excess successfully. I just wanted to get wasted. I wanted to get out there. I wanted the freedom of not being me, not having to know who I am, and not having to, and to be someone completely different and to be free from that person. And alcohol did that for me. You know, Bill describes in the big book when he talks about when he drank and he talked about how alcohol enabled him to do, feel, and believe those things he couldn't do on his own before. He also uses the same description in this spiritual awakening when he talks about when a man or woman has a spiritual awakening. They're able to do, feel, and believe those things they couldn't do before. But alcohol was my spiritual awakening. Um, I, for the first time I drank, the last time I drank, I was always a, an excess drinker. I blacked out, I passed out, I puked, sometimes not in that order. Um, and, uh, and that was never an issue for me. Um, are there any other pukers in the room? <laughs> anybody else, I would go outside, shove my finger down my throat and empty myself so I could go back in and drink some more. Um, because I wasn't through drinking. I didn't want to, I was like, let's just go ahead and get this over with. Cause I need to get back to the party. Um, I thought true love was holding back my hair. I figure if I, <laughs> I figure if I threw up on you on a date and you asked me out again, you liked me. You really, really liked me. And, uh, I never, ever, it never even dawned on me. It was gross or anything else. I just walked back in the bar. Anybody got a Tic Tac? Um, <clears throat> what's in your hair? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> All I knew is the freedom I got was worth it. It was worth all the consequences. Everything that happened to me, I was willing to pay. Um, and part of the thing that was almost going to kill me someday was the fact that I was a smart, geeky kid. <clears throat> and my teachers adored me. I performed. I could do all the work. And they lied for me. Um, and, that, and they always talk about the four things that can keep an alcoholic from getting sober. Health, wealth, youth, and intelligence. And I was a smart kid who worked my ass off, not because I had great, um, great character, but because I felt like if I'm special, maybe I'll feel okay. And, uh, and, and so I just, you know, did really well in school and, and uh, got away with murder <clears throat> um, because at that point it hadn't affected the rest of my life in any ways that I was willing to admit was a consequence for me. Um, I started dating um, my first ex-husband in high school, um, <clears throat> and uh, he was non-alcoholic. I think I saw him drunk three times in the eight years we were together, and it was a total puss. And, um, <clears throat> but his job was to nag me constantly about how much I drank. Um, and, and I can tell you that I carried this vain arrogance into sobriety, that what a party pooper he was, that he never wanted me to go anywhere or do anything with my friends. And it took inventory for me to realize that I always told him I was going to go have one or two. And I'd be home around 7 or 8. And I always came home knee-walking, blind drunk, about 3 or 4 in the morning, with my clothes in disarray, maybe with or without the car. And I couldn't understand why he didn't have a warm, fuzzy feeling about what I've been doing all night long. <clears throat> and why he might have had some trepidation about me leaving any time on my own. Um, 
But, you know, we, we uh, slugged it out for three years. It was horrible. It was a constant battle. And I didn't grow up with that type of dynamic. He, his drug of choice was anger, and he was a very violent person. And, uh, you know, after three years when it wouldn't, absolutely would not work anymore, um, we got married. And, uh, because <laughs> that'll fix everything. Um, and, you know, I was in the right place at the right time in my life, and I got a job um, that I did really, really well at. And um, within a short period of time, I was the highest paid female with this Fortune 500 company at the age of 24. And I was also the youngest. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a license to kill for me. Um, that little story about romance broke up. Um, and in the meantime, um, there was something that happened. Um, I, right before we, um, we decided to break up a couple years, I got pregnant. <clears throat> and I didn't want to be pregnant. And, there, and lots of reasons, and it wasn't financial because I was really good at making a buck. Um, but when I grew up as a young child, I wasn't safe. I wasn't safe as a little girl. And I remember telling myself that I would never bring a child in this world because no one protected me, so I don't want to bring anyone else in here. Because how am I going to ever guarantee that, that any child of mine would be safe? I wasn't. And uh, by the time I found out I was pregnant, it was too late for any other decisions to be made. And I was terrified of being emotionally responsible for another human being and responsible for their safety. And I can tell you what I did. I, I worked more, and I, she, she stayed with my mom, who was like uber grandmother of the year. Um, and my mom took care of her. I never asked any questions. And I got to justify that I had this big job, and I made all this money, and, and uh, no one ever said anything to me. And when that husband left, I remember thinking, whew. Thank God he's gone. I can I can drink and use like I want to. And I'll tell you, I'm a I'm a you know child of the '70s and a young adult of the '80s. And I did alcohol and all of its cousins. And uh, I was not picky about um, anything to change what I felt. And uh, I, I can tell you, if you think I'm fast now, you should have seen me in the '80s. Um, <laughs> that is vibrate mixed paint. Um, <clears throat> But I'll tell you, when that, when that person, that nag, that, that person who constantly talked to me about how much I drank or used left, and I was free to do anything I wanted to, it was on for me. Um, and I had this boss who, had, who was wonderful to me, and I, I always think about what it had to be like for that poor al -Anon to watch me just begin to go down in flames, because he loved me like I was his kid sister. And, um, and it, it, it got ugly real quick for me. And um, I remember one day he called me in to tell me, <laughs> and what I know now is that he'd gone to my employee assistance director, and she said, ooh, you can't talk to her. She makes more money than anybody else. It doesn't affect her job. Until it affects her job, you can't say squat to her. And, uh, but I guess he had permission to talk to me about the way I looked. Um, and I remember when he called me in and, and talked to me about the way I looked. And now I stayed up all night long because I had better living through modern chemistry, and uh, you, went, you know, changed clothes and went to work, um, living in the bars, reeked of smoke, and, and I've been on enough 12-step calls today to know that you can put on all the eau de parfum you want, so like eau de bio when you're walking around, um, sweating booze out of your pores, and um, I remember I was so offended that he would say anything to me about the way I looked. I remember thinking, oh my God, I've seen your wife, you know, <laughs> she was a lovely woman. She was able to do something I wasn't able to do, which was take care of her children. And, uh, but to pacify him, I went to go see this employee assistance director. Um, and she would ask me questions. And I remember every time she'd ask me about, I definitely wasn't telling her about any of the drugs I was doing. I wasn't that stupid. Um, but anytime she asked me about how much I drank, I instinctively lied and minimized it. Now, I know she had to smell me, too. Um, and... Uh, but I would always lie to this woman whenever she asked me about my drinking because I thought, it's none of your business. You most definitely don't understand my lifestyle. You have on a puffy sleeve blouse with a little lace cardigan. I don't think we run in the same circles. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure she didn't. But, uh, um, but I, I, you know, part of my story is that I was this, I drank everywhere, but I loved drinking out there. I mean, and I, and, and I don't even know why, and I think it was that craving, that connection with another human being. But I don't know if anyone else knows about being in a crowd and being absolutely alone. Um, I had no connection with those people. Um, I was just there. 
and I was craving anything and, and whatever um, physical contact just to be with a group of people and not be isolated by myself with my head. In the end of my drinking, I would get physically drunk, but I wouldn't get mentally drunk, and that was a horrible place to be because that was always my pattern. I would get so physically drunk, I couldn't protect myself. And that was my story as a woman. And especially if you're out there doing things and, and in those kind of situations, there are all kinds of people who will take advantage of that. And uh, I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to be there. But despite everything, I cannot tell you how many times I said, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to be a good mom. I'm going to clean my house. I'm going to cook a real meal. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read my daughter a story and put her to bed. I'm going to, do, I'm going to go to work tomorrow and stay all day. I just want to do 24 hours of normal. And uh, the phone would ring and I'd be off. And, uh, you know, one of the nights that um, definitely changed my life was a night like any other night I'd been out, I'd been, I'd gotten, you know, severely incapacitated, drunk, and uh, passed out in, a, in an apartment at this party I was at. When I came to, and I came to a lot in my drinking, but this time I, when I came to, <clears throat> there was blood everywhere. Everywhere. Part of my story in the end was, you know, alcohol used to keep everything bottled up. And in the end, I became very angry when I drank. Um, I got very violent with people. I got tossed out of one bar twice for biting the bouncer because he was kicking me out. And uh, sweet girl. And um, <clears throat> But I would just lash out at anyone. And, and I remember that being my fear when I would hurt people is, you know, one of these days I'm going to harm somebody really bad. And I came to in this um, room and... Uh, it took a while for me to even try to comprehend what had happened. And I, all I knew was I was searching, saying, please don't let me find a body in this room. Please, please tell me I haven't harmed somebody. And I remember the relief I felt when I realized that the blood was mine. Um, that I'd been brutally raped and left for dead. I'd been strangled until I, I think, I'm pretty sure he thought I was dead, but I didn't die. And I remember crawling to an emergency room, this is years ago, and uh, they put me in the waiting room for hours, and they put a towel on the chair because I was still actively bleeding out. And I sat there with all these people watching. They didn't even try to whisper because I had bruises all over my neck. <clears throat> and uh, I just remember crying these this puddle of bloody tears on the floor, frozen to that chair, wishing I could get up and run out of that ER, but I was just too wounded to do it. And I could hear the way they were talking about me and pointing at me and talking about that, can you smell her? She's drunk. And uh, I wanted to die that night so badly. And I wish I could tell you that it got me sober, but it didn't. Um, it made me want to crawl in a bottle even more because I needed relief after that happened. The full circle for me, and I am so grateful that one of the things in Alcoholics Anonymous and being in recovery is that there's no waste in God's economy was in sobriety, I went back to school, and I became a nurse, and I became a forensic nurse so I could take care of sexual assault victims. And I never put anybody in the waiting room, and I never sat them on a towel, and I never let people point and talk about them, and I tried to give them the compassion and the dignity and, and the empathy that I wished someone had given me that night, and I damn sure never let anybody tell them it was their fault for what had happened to them that night. I wanted to be a part of the solution in their lives. So I'm so grateful that AA has given me a way to take some of one of the most horrific moments in my life that took me years to talk about and lots of professional help in order to get there to say, this does not have to define me. I get to be a part of the solution for someone else's life. Um, but I just crawled into the bottle. I, for those next, um, those next couple months, I just wanted to die. And I and, it, and that was that death wish. I don't know if anyone ever else in here has said, I just want to die with drinking. I just want to not wake up one more morning. And, um, you know, I'd had one of those nights where I said, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good tonight. And the phone rang, and I was off. And uh, um, I was out with these two girls at night, and they were beautiful girls. They were acquaintances. I couldn't have told you their last names. Kind of like AA. Um, but, uh, but I remember we were, you know, doing the same stuff that we always did. And um, 
and I was watching them. I had this moment where I was just, even though I was so physically drunk, but not mentally drunk, and my mind was going. And, and I will tell you, you know, in AA, they talk about your assets become your liabilities, and your liabilities become your assets. Well, one of my biggest liabilities is that I'm an extremely opinionated, judgmental asshole. And um, <laughs> I love to take your inventory. And um, my sponsor is... Um, German. She's lived in Texas for 50 years, so her accent is bizarre. And, uh, <clears throat> and she always says, we're not gossiping, we're just reporting. And, um, <clears throat> but I had this moment where I looked at these two beautiful women I was out with, and I took their inventory, and I thought, my God, Madeline, what is a nice girl like you doing with that, out with these two drunk cocaine whores? And, um, and I heard this voice say... <clears throat> Have you taken a look at you lately? And I don't know where that voice came from because I drank to shut it the hell up, but it spoke up that night, and I looked at me. When I looked at them, I saw myself. I couldn't even rationalize that I was half a car length behind them. I would do anything to change the way I felt. I would sell my soul for a drink or a drug. It didn't matter what the consequences were. It did not matter where it took me. I'd love to tell you that things changed that night. That night got much worse for me. And the next day, I went into my um, work one more time, coming to and uh, trying to figure out where I am in a city of 4 million people, and um, called my boss and told him I was going to be late. Told him I had car trouble. Car was brand new. I'm sure he was like, oh, Jesus, she needs to find a better excuse. But, uh, <clears throat> but I got to that office, and I knew. I just knew inside me I was done. I was done. That everything I touched, I hurt. And... Uh, and I told him, I said, you know, I called my big brother and I asked him if I could come live with him. And uh, I gave my boss my resignation. And he came in and he sat down across from me and he was this beautiful big Greek man with these long lashes and he just had tears streaming down his cheeks. And um, he just reached across the desk and he took my hand. And I said, I got to go. Everybody would be better if I just go. I said, I'm an alcoholic and... Uh, I just, I just need to leave. Now, I was going to move to Los Angeles, California to get away from alcohol and drugs. <laughs> I wasn't going to come to Casper or someplace like that. Um, but uh, I always remember that man reaching across the desk and squeezing my hand and looking in his eyes with those tears streaming down his cheeks. And he said, have you ever tried drinking just a little? <laughs> oh, man. I was pissed because I, I felt so hopeless and so helpless when he said those things to me. And here's the truth. First step, no, I've never tried drinking just a little. It's my first step today. I don't want to drink just a little. I have never wanted one drink unless it was in a bucket. I've never wanted one pill, one line, one nut, nut, one man, you know, whatever. The list goes on. I have an amount problem. I drank for the effect. I drank to escape. I have no desire to be a normal drinker. I have no desire and, uh, and I left his office that day, and I went home. And later on, he sent one of my employees to come babysit me because um, he knew something he could see in my eyes that I hadn't admitted to myself, and that was that I was going to take my life. I was dying. And uh, I tried not drinking that day. I would say it was the longest eight hours of my life. And uh, I talked her into going and getting drunk with me. And I'm sure that wasn't in his plan, but I'll tell you something. It kept me alive that day. Alcohol kept me alive long enough for me to find you. And I am so grateful for that. I'm not sure if I hadn't had alcohol what I would have done before I got here, but alcohol saved my life until I found Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, that next week, I just tried to kill myself with anything and everything I could put in me. And when I couldn't not drink and I couldn't drink and it wasn't doing what it used to do, um, I was still living with all the pain and all the anguish, nothing. It was no longer a solution. I got no relief from it. I, uh, I did sit down and put, take that gun out, cocked it and put it in my mouth and cried, wishing I could pull the trigger because I knew how much everybody would be better off. And it wasn't morbid. It truly in my heart of hearts, I thought I can't do this and I can't keep hurting people. I don't know about you, but I've lost a lot of people in, in, in and out of recovery. And I understand that pain when you get to that point to where you can't take it anymore. I remember one night I was working in the ER, and I'd had a young woman who had tried to take her life, alcoholic. And uh, I called in a social worker for crisis intervention. 
And through the curtain, I heard the social worker tell her that she was a coward. And I pulled the curtain back, and I said, can I talk to you for a minute? (laughs) And we went to the nurse's station and had to come to Jesus. And uh, I said, I don't know what your life experience is. I'm making some assumptions, which maybe I shouldn't, but I'm, I'm making some assumptions. You maybe haven't walked the same path she's at right now, and that you maybe haven't arrived at the same destination she's at right now, where she thinks the only way her life will be any better is to end it. And if you think adding more shame and guilt on top of what she feels is helpful, I'm going to tell you you're in the wrong profession. If you want to be helpful, here's a website, here's phone numbers, there are people who will come up here and stay with her, there are people who will go home with her and make sure that she stays safe and get her to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's helpful. I don't want to ever hear you say that to one of my patients again. And I can tell you he didn't. He taught every social worker in that hospital how to use the AA.org website and the ARA website. And we're friends on Facebook. So, um, (laughs) but you know, I made a phone call to that employee assistance director that I'd lied to. And I said, I've lost my mind. I've lost my mind and I don't know what to do. And, um, I called a friend of mine and she called a couple of friends of mine and I had people there who, who were there to make sure I stayed safe. God bless them. And, uh, my drunk boyfriend, um, that I had acquired, of course, um, drove me up to her office. And I remember she gave me that same little test that she gave me before. And this time I told the truth and I got an A. And uh, <clears throat> I remember she said, are you willing to do anything to change the way you're feeling? And I said, I, I'm willing to walk down the middle of Woodlands Parkway naked if it'll help. And she giggled because I had. And uh, <laughs> got my picture in the paper. My boss was proud. And I... Uh, <clears throat> And she said, well, you're going to go to this place. And I said, oh, I'm going to drive there every day. She said, no, you're going to stay there. And she called him in to make sure he was sober enough to drive me and, uh, and, and threw some stuff in a suitcase. And the next thing I knew, because I'd had this standing reservation I knew nothing about, um, my ass got hauled off to chemical camp. And uh, um, I had no idea. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I didn't know anybody who was sober. I'd never known anyone who went to treatment. And, uh, and this was, like, way out in the middle of nowhere. And... Um, and I remember they put me in this room, and they took my stuff, and they appeared to have no sense of humor. And um, <clears throat> they brought in all this literature. And, um, and then they brought in my roommate, who was a beautiful, tall British nurse who had a bad habit of a little for you and a lot for her. And um, she was like five months pregnant, you couldn't tell. Um, and uh, so we're sitting there, and, and I remember I, the fog is starting to clear. And, and they gave us... Um, they gave us some pamphlets and some books to, you know, in there. And I remember looking at the big book and thinking, I'm not going to be here that long. And, uh, (laughs) but I saw some pamphlets and I started reading them. And uh, because I can read a pamphlet and I saw that they were talking about not drinking one day at a time, but I'm smarter than the average bearer. And I read right through that. They were talking about never drinking again. And I remember thinking, holy crap, Madeline, you drama queen. What the hell have you done? This is crazy talk. They're talking about never drinking again. You have overreacted. And um, the whole time that I was sitting there trying to convince myself that I've overreacted, the voice in my head was going, God, I wish I had a drink. God, I wish I had a drink. I would take drugs I don't like right now. I would do anything. I would do anything. And this other little voice said, Normal people don't get themselves locked up out in BFE wearing someone else's jammies trying to convince themselves they're not an alcoholic and the whole time all they can think about doing is drinking. It doesn't happen. And uh, and I thought, well, maybe. And uh, But I started taking this little gold pencil they give you because they're afraid you're going to kill yourself with a real pencil and started making little prisoner hash marks to figure out how long I was going to be in there. <laughs> And this is November the 14th, and my brother was getting married that weekend. And by the way, it's my crazy brother. And um, the rest of my family is so damn normal, and I have this one crazy brother. Um, He's having his whole body frozen. I think that qualifies. Um, Because his genius must live on. Um, Um, But I realized I'd missed his wedding. I was going to miss his wedding. And I thought, well, I know I would have been drunk. I would have been drunk at a baby shower, but I would have been drunk at his wedding. And then I realized that I put myself in there for Thanksgiving. And I thought, ooh, crap. Uh, It's not a big holiday in my life. But my moment came when I realized I'd put myself in there for Christmas. 
I had a three-year-old child. Ah, afterthought. And I don't know about you, but when I was out there running and gunning, I wasn't at pre-planning my life and thinking about Christmas or the next event. I was living it truly one day at a time, drink to drink. And um, I had that first honest thought in my life about the fact that my actions harm others. I always justified and rationalized that my drinking and my stuff didn't hurt anybody. Get off my back. I make plenty of money. You're all taken care of. Leave me alone. And uh, I couldn't I couldn't rationalize and justify this one. I knew I wasn't going to be there, and I knew she had nothing going to be coming from me. Not coming from a big family. She was the first grandchild. I knew she was going to be spoiled rotten, but it made no difference to me. I knew for a fact that my actions hurt her. And uh, I started to sob, and then I started to just wail, and then I just lost it. It became a complete shit show. And, uh, and I remember my roommate, who, as I said, very stoic British woman, um, it appeared she had a three-year-old boy the same age, and I am hysterically sobbing about what a horrible woman I am and how much damage I've done to my child and how she's going to be so hurt. I remember this poor woman coming over and sitting it down on the bed. And you know when someone really doesn't want to comfort you, but they feel obligated, and they're kind of like this <laughs> stiff pat. And, uh, and I'm losing it. And there's like a, the, the people, you know, because we're in the detox room. You can't even see through the faces who are all looking in at the shit show. But uh, um, all of a sudden, I hear Sandra. I start to see her sobbing a little bit. And then all of a sudden, she just lets out this, I guess it's a British whale. And she just lost her stuff, too. And we're both in there hysterically crying, and and uh, um, and about and we've, we've attracted a crowd. And about that time, I always remember because poor little Sandra said, "Oh, Madeline, how did we get ourselves into this bloody effing mess?" <laughs> I remember the director of that treatment center came in, and he was a member of the fellowship, a physician who was a a director of that treatment center, and he sat down in the middle of that snot fest on the bed and uh, was trying to comfort us, and I remember him telling me and Sandra that we were going to be giving our children the best Christmas present we could ever give them. And I thought, you are so full of shit. Are you kidding? Uh, Three years old, I'm pretty sure toys are in there, and... um, and I thought, and you know, and I knew even as a horrible and ineffective a mother I was, I knew that it meant something to my daughter for me to be there. And I was in a lockdown rehab. I wasn't going anywhere. I was not going to be able to be present in her life on that damn day. And it affected me. And I'm so grateful it affected me. Because I can tell you that to this day, the best Christmas present, the best birthday present, the best anything I have ever given my child was becoming a sober mother in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hands down, my greatest gift to myself was having that pain that day that has absolutely affected me every day since, that wanting to be someone different today. I can tell you that that child, AA taught me how to be a mom. I didn't know how to love anybody. I had so many walls up, and you taught me about unconditional love. My sponsor, I would take her to meetings, and Judy would feed her chocolate the entire meeting. And then she'd go, ooh, she's yours. Take her home. And, uh, but she got lost in your arms at meetings. You just loved her like nobody's business, like we do with those AA Albrats, man. And, um, and we didn't have iPads and stuff back then. It was the coloring book and the, you know, and the Happy Meal. And uh, she grew up loving Alcoholics Anonymous. She still does today. You know, she has grown up in the middle of these rooms and with all the people in my home. I always tell the story. One day I was at the dentist office with her, and she was chatting up the little old lady next to her. And I was ignoring her. I was reading people. Um, my child's a friendly child, and, and she's like six and uh, and she starts telling this woman about all the uncles who come to our house and they stay all night and they sleep on the couch. There's Uncle Stanley. There's Uncle Craig. And she's running out of fingers. <clears throat> and Grandma's giving me the stink eye and I'm burying my head in people. Because I thought, how am I going to explain to this woman that these are the men who are like uncles to her because they're like brothers to me. They come over to my house, they eat all my food, they watch my cable TV and they go home. Nothing funny going on. But I thought I can't explain that to grandma in the middle of the dentist office. She can just think I'm a hoe. So, <laughs> Years later, Laura and I were in the car and I said, why didn't you mention all the women who were at our house all the time? She just went, 
thought you were such a turd. You knew what you were doing. But um, <laughs> yanking grandma's chain. But uh, I, I, I can tell you that I went, the best thing that happened to me in that treatment center was the fact that Alcoholics Anonymous brought meetings into that treatment center seven nights a week. And during the day, folks brought in big book studies, 12 and 12 studies. I was inundated with what the real program of Alcoholics Anonymous is. They didn't leave it to the treatment center to show me what Alcoholics Anonymous was. Alcoholics Anonymous came in and made sure I knew what it was. And there was an old guy in that treatment center that, as far as I could tell, had been sober since Jesus was a little kid. And uh, he was an old coon ass named Frenchie. And Frenchie saved my life. And uh, he knew everybody, everybody. And I said, I don't know anybody who's sober like where I live. Do you know someone that would be my sponsor? And so he came back and he said, here, here's a phone number. I've talked to her. And if you call her and ask her, she'll be your temporary sponsor. And I called her and I, her name was Judy M. And, uh, and she, I said, told her when I was going to get out. And she said, great. I'm chairing the meeting that night. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll meet you at the meeting. I'm easy to spot because I'm chairing. And she was so incredibly sweet and gracious on that phone. And I found out later that was a total act because she was a shrew. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I walked out that first night out of treatment and I walked into that meeting and she immediately waved at me and I thought, how'd she know I was a new girl? Um, <laughs> And I immediately didn't like her. And I don't know if there's anybody else in here, especially us girls, that we do that thing, we take the little computerized and go, dee, 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 dee. no, don't like her. <laughs> Hasn't even opened her mouth yet, but I know I'm not going to like her. And um, I looked at her and I said, oh, my God, what a terrible mistake. And, um, but I went to coffee afterwards with her and her oldest baby, Yuta, who's my sponsor today, and Yuta's oldest baby. And, um, and I was trying to tell Yuta and Judy um, and Ellen my plans for staying sober. Um, after completing my treatment, and um, Ellen was very polite. Judy and Utah didn't even hide the fact that they thought I was completely full of shit. They were like rolling around the booth and slapping each other and pointing. I remember thinking, bitches, I'm sitting right here. I can see you making fun of me. And, uh, <laughs> but what Judy said to me saved my life, too. She said, I'll tell you what sponsorship is. It's guidance and direction. And here's my guidance and direction. I believe that you really have to work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the only way to get better. And you have to be, you have to practice these traditions. You're involved in everything in this home group and anything else that needs to be done around here, we raise our hands. We get all the way in the middle. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. But don't tell anybody I'm your sponsor. And I said, yes, ma'am. Because I'll tell you as, 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 Everything else about her, what I saw was this amazing strength. I saw a woman who was comfortable in her skin and, and didn't take anything off of anybody but had an incredible capacity to love you back to health. And, uh, and for every step I took, I know she pulled me three. Um, and I can tell you that I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you people were talking about stuff that I was taken to my grave. Um, and you were just, like, blabbing about it at the table. And I had this, this incredible urge to put my hand over your mouth and go, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> stop. Stop saying that in public. Um, but part of that sharing made me realize that none of us got here with wings and halos, that many of us have been down the same paths. We've done the same things. We've, we've experienced many of the same things. But I'll tell you, I reached that point to where I'm not one of those who could hang out for very long without getting on in those steps. Um, and my experience has been, I believe that coming to AA and just not drinking is kind of like throwing up and not opening your mouth. <laughs> You're going to get a little relief, and then it's going to get real bloody uncomfortable. And that's why I had to work the steps, because otherwise I was walking around with all this puke of my life that I needed to do something with. Not drinking was never the answer for me. Not drinking will make me batshit crazy. I needed recovery, and that was in the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous for me. So when I called her and I said, my program is not working very well, I think I need to write a four-step. She said, good, see you at seven, because our program works perfectly. And she laid out what I needed to do, and she said, I'll see you at my house next week. And I'm so grateful she didn't say, call me when you're done. We'll talk. She gave me a deadline. And I had to be accountable and show up at her house, and I was terrified. And the reason I was terrified is because I was going to tell someone for the first time in my life, not even so much the things I'd done, but the things I thought and felt that I thought made me a horrible, horrible, defective human being. The crazy stuff that ran around in my head that I never wanted anybody to know. 
And there's no worse feeling than sitting in Alcoholics Anonymous and feeling all this love and acceptance and affection and having this arm out that says, but if you really knew me, you wouldn't feel that way. And that's where I felt before I started completing those steps. And I can tell you that I sat down and I did that complete fifth step with her, and she shared with me. And this woman I thought was so different that I couldn't imagine I had anything in common with was me. That alcoholic math happened when I left there that makes no sense. I knew after I told her everything, she loved me more than when I arrived at her house. And I had never experienced that before in my life that someone knew me and loved me. One of the greatest gifts you get in Alcoholics Anonymous is that people can know you and love you. And uh, it was so important for me. It was so important for me to keep on with those steps. You know, six and seven are like cresting that hill. And um, and seven describes humility in the, in the 12 and 12, and it, and it calls it a precious quality. And for me, when I paraphrase it in that paragraph when I was talking about it, it says, if all we do is just not drink, If all I do is just not drink, I'm not going to change. And if I don't change, I won't be happy. And if I'm not happy, I will absolutely return to drinking. I call it the secret handshake of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had to do those steps and recognize what I had to change in me, not you, so I could get better. So I could know that I could get through these steps and get on with clearing up the wreckage of my past and growing up in this life called recovery. Um... The 12th step for me is so important because the women in my life have made such a difference. I had these sponsors. um, You know, Judy moved when I was three and a half years sober, and Utah was her oldest baby who had always been back at quarterback and was like, tag, you're it. You know, she's numbing from that first meeting out. Um, Her advice always to me is whenever I call her to talk to her about I'm going to speak tonight or whatever, she said, oh, honey, do great. Please don't go to that meeting and tell those people all your high-class problems. Love you. Bye. I hang us up on me. <laughs> <laughs> but service has been the secret for me. When we talk about this spiritual life, you have to live it. And, and you know, the first page of the service manual says that an AA service is anything that helps carry the 12-step message. From that 10-cent cup of coffee, remember the day, to the stuff that happens in our New York office. All of it has value. It's about all of us finding our place and where we can be of service. You know, I got married in sobriety. Um, There was a man that I really didn't want to have anything to do with. I was wanting to join a convent and make them all go away because I'd had horrible experiences drunk, but I got to tell you, I had some horrible experiences sober in early sobriety of men being very inappropriate. Um, I mean, we had some true predators in my old home group, one who's been to prison three times, um, one for raping a 14-year-old girl I gave a ride home from a meeting. But then there was just the icky behavior. Um, I know I'm not the only one in here who's ever had that creepy dude hug and... uh, um, we want to take a bath in Lysol. And, uh, and I'm so great. I mean, it's like I've had mammograms that weren't that personal. They were gross. But, um, <laughs> but my sponsor taught me I didn't have to tolerate that behavior. She said, be rude. You do not have to tolerate that behavior. That's inappropriate. This is sacred ground here. We don't tolerate that. And you don't have to be nice about it. You be firm about it. And she taught me how to stand up for me and stand up for other people. And don't think that women are the only ones with bad behavior. I mean, men are the only ones with bad behavior. Women can be just as bad. Um, But uh, um, I met this man in the rooms, and he was very nice. Um, And it was through a tragedy that I became friends with him. And, uh, and, you know, we went out for lunch. And, I, um, you know, for both of us, it was like, boom. You know, the the punch was thrown, and we were in love. and, And we were that AA couple. And uh, he was my soulmate, and I adored him. And um, we got married. Um, we, we moved to Idaho in 1993. And um, so there were some things that always plagued that marriage. And it was always described as inappropriate friendships with other women. And uh, I remember I was living, we were living in Idaho. Um, problems had continued to happen, but this woman called one day, and I'm pretty sure she was looking for him. I knew her from Texas, and I always felt like she had a very inappropriate friendship with my with my husband. And uh, at the time, um, I was in service. I think um, um, I was trustee. And she called, and uh, she was dying of alcoholism. And this is, I don't know about anybody else, if you ever had that thing of when you're in a room and you want to, you know, you want to be a spiritual giant, but you think, oh, God, please don't let that woman ask me. Um, and I can tell you, I did not want to help this woman. And I talked to her on the phone, and something happens when you're talking to death on the phone. Someone's dying of alcoholism, and I'm sitting over here thinking about whether or not to help. 
And, you know, AA kicks in. I went to Houston, took her to meetings, introduced her to my sponsor, everybody else I knew, and we talked every day. And she was struggling big time. Her mom was dying. It was a terrible situation. And uh, she called me one day, drunk, right before Christmas, and she said, um, I can't do this anymore. I cannot stay sober. I have way too much guilt. And uh, I can't believe you'd help me. You've been like the only person who's ever tried to just help me. And how can you help me when I'm your husband's mistress? And I have to tell you, I said, I don't care. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. I said, I don't care. Please hang on five more minutes. Because I knew where she was at because I'd been there. And I said, hang on five more minutes. I'll get some women to your house. I know, you know I know people. They can be at your house in minutes. And, you know, she hung up that phone and she killed herself. And uh, something broke for me. But I was never going to be the same. And uh, I was so devastated. And anyone who's ever had anyone that you've lost in sobriety and you worry about everything you said, was there a ton of my voice? Did I say the right thing? Did I do everything I could to try to help that person? And I know I can't kill anybody and I can't keep them alive. But it killed me that she couldn't hang on for five more minutes because I've been that woman. And uh, I left that marriage after 22 years and I thought I was going to die. Thank God for service because I wasn't able to just curl up in the fetal position. I had to put one foot in front of the other because my commitment to Alcoholics Anonymous has always been drilled into me. as like Pavlov's dog. Do the next right thing. You need to get on the plane and you got to be there. You got to go do this. And I'll tell you, my sponsee, my sponsees carried me through that, carried me through that. And many times I hear women come to me and they say, you know, my sponsor is really going through a rough patch. Would you sponsor me? I say, always say, you know what? I'd be more than happy to help you any way I can. But let me share with you that if my sponsees had all walked out when my life fell apart, I don't know if I'd be standing here today. Those women turn the tables. Sponsorship is such a racket anyway. Your sponsees do so much more for you than you ever do for them. But literally, they carried me through a time when I, I was so in so much pain and in so much sorrow. And, uh, and my sponsor, who said, we'll get through this. We'll get through this, but you're going to have to do some writing. You know that. She also banned me from Facebook. Um, <laughs> seems I had his password, and I changed all of his hobbies. And uh, <laughs> Lying, cheating, lecherous old man with a limp member. Anyway, um, <laughs> that was a really fun one to have to go back and make amends for. <laughs> It was so worth it, but uh, um, <laughs> but I can tell you that, you know, and, and, and I, um, what I found in the middle of all that writing was the same flawed thinking I came in here with, that I can rest satisfaction on this life if only I manage well. If I'm just pretty enough and I dance fast enough and I make everything okay, nothing bad will ever happen to me. He'll always love me. And the bottom line is that was not going to happen. That was not going to happen. You know, I remember writing my inventory, my first inventory. One of my friends in the program gave me some great guidance. He said, you know, when you're writing that inventory and you're doing your sex inventory, he said, what you're going to find out is you have to take your God in the bedroom. And I said, are you out of your mind? I barely let him ride in traffic with me. And um, what I found was absolutely true. If my God can't watch and my God can't listen, don't do it. Clears up a whole lot of stuff. I think the questions on page 69 are so right on. There's nothing vague about them. Am I being selfish, dishonest, deceitful? Am I arousing suspicion or jealousy? You know, and I can tell you that I know in my heart of hearts, the man of my dreams will never be someone else's husband. I'm not wired that way. AA has taught me different about being someone different. And what came out of that writing was that just because I'm years sober, I still get wet when it rains. And I, I moved across the state because he played hide the salami with half the people we worked with. And, um, and I'm so grateful for service because I knew people when I got there. And they scooped me up and they said, come to this meeting. I said, it's in the middle of nowhere. And they said, it's a great meeting. And it was a great meeting because the women in that room picked me up and did not care who I was or how I was. I'd walk into meetings. I'd be 
Sometimes I was crying hysterically. Sometimes I was spewing fire, sometimes both at the same time. And I talked a whole lot about running over my ex-husband with my car. And um, <laughs> I am from Texas, after all. And um, scared the crap out of the men in the rooms. They were like, can't you make her better? And um, <laughs> the women didn't care. They were like, oh, hell, girl, I'll drive. I got a truck. Let's go kick his ass right now. And... Uh, they let me be as angry as I needed to be. They let me be as hurt as I need to be. They let me heal in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they let me get better one day at a time. And no one ever shamed me and told me I should be in a different place. I got to get better just like I did day one. I got to do the same thing in year 24, get better one day at a time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had sponsees who were still going to meetings with him, and they wanted to kill him. And I said, no, 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 no. That's my job. And um, <laughs> I said, we can't afford enemy camps in Alcoholics Anonymous, ever. When we take those traditions to heart, it, we mean it. He has to feel welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous. His life depends on it. So you make sure you smile at him, you wave at him, you give him a hug if he'll let you. Because he needs to know that he's still welcome in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You cannot drag my pain into what goes on in that home group. Now, i got to tell you, I secretly hoped that he would contract a rare tropical disease and his penis would fall off. <laughs> but I have never, ever wanted that man to drink. And at the end of that writing, when I had to take those actions, I prayed for him, and I acted like a kind and caring ex-wife. I said, please and thank you. I made sure he had pictures of his children and his grandchildren and all that kind of good stuff. I did the right things. I let him know if one of our mutual friends was sick or ill. I did the things that I needed to do for me to where I have no guilt and no shame. That's what you gave me. And you enabled me to get that writing done and to be able to say, what do I want, what do I need, and what do I deserve in my life? And never feel guilty about asking for those things in my life today in recovery. That it's not okay for me to say I'm going to have to settle and just stay with something that I know is bad for me. That I can do something different. And today my life is so different. You know, I moved to Portland because that's where my one and only child is. She's married and she had my little grandson, Gavin, the gargantuan. And uh, he's got these little buck teeth, and he's got big ears and dimples, and he's just the cutest little thing. Anyway, um, and he has my heart. He will crawl up in my lap, and he will put his arms around my neck, and he will say, oh, Mimi, I love you so much. I don't tell you that near enough. And I think, oh, I'm saving your bail money now. <laughs> Dad will leave you there, but you call Mimi. I'll come get you. And, uh, <laughs> and my little granddaughter, Olivia, was born after I moved there and I got to be there. And I've been able to be there for my grandchildren's births and to be able to be their Mimi. And uh, I love her. Oh, she's mini me. Um, my daughter had her in Target a couple weeks ago. And uh, there were some kids screaming. And she turned and she said, shut up, God damn it. Was, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> I get to be a part of their lives, you know? <laughs> but I would have missed it if I hadn't had that. Well, we've heard from the speakers so far that second surrender. You know, that times will get tough in Alcoholics Anonymous. They will get tough in Al Anon. And that I don't get this perfect life, but damn it, I get a way to get through it. And I never have to do it alone. This lonely, shy, neurotic child who could not relate and, and have anyone behind those walls gets to have this incredible life full of beauty today. And I get to have it wherever I go. When I moved to Idaho, I had this woman that knew I was in the program but didn't quite understand. And uh, she was normal. And I remember one day she said, you know, you just like moved here and you have all these friends. She said, I think I lived here for like three years before I had what I consider a really good friend. And you just like have all these friends. I don't understand it. And I said, well, Carrie, drink like a pig and destroy your life and you can have friends everywhere you go. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And it's the truth. You can have it everywhere you go. You may not know each other, but there's that, con that immediate bond and kinship that you feel within these rooms. And I am so grateful for it. I want to close with a story, and especially for me, I always talk about this because of those heady games of staying right-sized in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, Idaho treated me so beautifully when I was their delegate that you'd start thinking they're going to play Hail to the Chief when you walk in the room. And people tend to try to start treating you like that different class of alcoholic. And trustee was the same way. I was showered with so much love and affection and some real undeserved attention many times. And it's real easy to start believing that stuff and to start thinking, 
something, don't you know who I am, and all those things. And uh, so I like to close with a story about staying right-sized. And it has a religious backdrop to it, but it's for context, if you'll excuse me. And I want you to picture that it's Palm Sunday, and Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on his donkey. And I mean, the streets are packed. Everybody is there to try to catch a glimpse of the Messiah. And they are throwing palms and flowers, and they're all chanting, Hail to Messiah! Hail to the Chosen One! And I mean, it is the most incredible sight anyone has ever seen. And then I want you to think for just one minute, what if the donkey thought all that was for him? (laughs) And haven't I done the same thing in Alcoholics Anonymous as a servant? That I start to think that all the applause or love or affection or acclamation or anything else has anything at all to do with me instead of that perfect program. So when I leave here and you leave here, I hope you always remember, it has nothing to do with me, but I am the jackass that gets to carry that message. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.